there. Thanks for joining me. My name is Melissa from Teacher Thrive. And today I wanted to talk about one of the subjects that I love for math, and that is non-routine problem solving. And what non-routine problems are, basically any, oops, any type of a math problem that requires some level of creativity and problem solving to solve. And they also, the very best non-routine problems, typically have multiple ways to solve them. So I'm going to show you an example of one and um, three different strategies of solving it. And then I'll show you an example of other types because there are really infinite types of non-routine problem solving um, math problems that you can present your students. So I'm just going to see, show you, let's cancel, let's see, show you my PowerPoint. Okay, let's get you zoomed in there. Okay, so hopefully you can see my PowerPoint. Let me know if you can't see it in the comments, or if you can, just give me a thumbs up so I can tell if you're seeing it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I can't see it. I know you guys can. Let's see. Hang on here. All right, I'm going to try to just navigate this through my very tiny screen. Okay, so here's an example of a non-routine problem that you could present your students. So this says um, you would ask your students to study this tower of cubes and notice First of all, that not all the cubes are visible, so they're looking at this two-dimensional rendering of something that's supposed to be three-dimensional, so it's going to be a little bit of a challenge for some students. And then you want the students to determine how many cubes there are in the tower. So there's a few different strategies that students might use to solve this, and one strategy we'll look at is making a table of layers and then the number of cubes in each layer. So for instance, if we looked at layer, oops, sorry, uh, layer one and layer one you can see has two cubes. So one times two is two. And then if a student were to look at the second layer below layer one, they would then see that two times three is six, or six layers in that cube. So they're basically looking at um, each layer as an array. So they're looking at how wide and how long each layer is to find the dimensions to multiply. And there we go. We are going, okay, so layer three, um, there you would see layer three, three times four equals 12. So there's 12 cubes in that layer. And then layer four, the students would um, use the dimensions of that layer to find that there's 20. And then adding up all of the cubes in each layer, they would know that the entire arrangement has 40 cubic units. So another similar strategy um, but this time it's looking at the number of exposed cubes you can see. So for instance, in the first layer, you can see all of the cubes. So you have two cubes. And um, now we're going to build on what we know from the previous layer. So the information we have from the previous layer is, um, well, first of all, that layer we can see, um, and this layer before would be four plus two. So you can see four visible cubes in that second layer, and then you have the two above it, which means that there would be six cubes in this layer. And then the third layer, the visible cubes that you can see, there are six of them. 
you also have the four visible ones from above and then the two. So you would have six plus four plus two, and that's 12 layers or 12 cubes in that layer. And then finally, for the fourth layer, you would have um, adding up all subsequent layers. You would see that it's eight plus six plus four plus two. And then you would get your total, which is 40. So that's one way of looking at it. So you can see there's multiple ways of solving it. And then for this problem, there's even another way. So some students might choose to look at this arrangement and see columns. So we would make a, a graph with three columns and one of them would be number of columns, um, number of cubes in the columns, and then the total number of cubes. So for instance, if we look at these two columns, so imagine you're going straight down to the base of this arrangement, there are four cubes in each of these columns and there's two of them. So two times four means that there's eight cubes. Now, if we look at the next set of columns, there's four columns right there. And the, each column has three cubes in it. So four times three is 12. The next set of columns, there's six of them, and they are two cubes high. So six times two is 12. And then finally, we have this last set, which eight, and they're one cube high, so eight times one is eight. And again, you would add up the total and come to 40. So I'm showing you this example so you can see that there are multiple ways to solve non-routine problems. And that's where it gets really fun and interesting for your, teach your students because they get to present their different ways of solving the same problem. And so you get lots of rich math discussion in your classroom and students have to explain their thinking, either showing their thinking or their problem solving strategy uh, with visuals or uh, using columns or tables like we did here. Now I'm just gonna run through a few more examples of non-routine problems. I'm not gonna go through solving them, but just to give you an idea of what they look like and how widely varying they can be. Um, so here's one. Uh, there are 18 animals in a pet store. Some are birds and some are dogs. There are 50 legs in all. How many birds and how many dogs are there? So that's one example. You can see how students could approach this in several different ways solving it. Here is another example. If I can get my cursor in the right spot. There we go. Um, a batch of cookies can be divided into equal shares among two, three, four, five, or six people with no cookies left over. What is the least number of cookies that the batch could have? So this is going to be really, it's talking about uh, multiples and um, least common multiples, greatest common factors. But students, again, they don't have to know that terminology to figure out a way to solve this. This one is a nice visual one. So it has two scales and it says, if the cone weighs six kilograms, what are the weights of the cube and the cylinder? There's an example. Oops, sorry, I'm losing my PowerPoint here. Okay. Um, here's one, three containers have capacities of three, five, and nine liters. How can you use these three containers to measure exactly seven liters of water? I think I have one more, I do. So this one has a sign with different uh, destinations and the distances from the sign. And it says you are halfway between Greensville and Parsons. How far away are you from Denbrow? So again, you can see this would require some, a, some bit of creativity. And that's what I love about non-routine problems is that you can't just teach an algorithm. Students aren't following necessarily um, a set of prescribed steps. They really have to just get in there and start thinking and start solving. So let's see if I can get my screen back. There we go, we're back, okay. Let's see if I can make that a little larger. 
Now I have some resources to get you started and to get your students started so that they are um, able to do this successfully. Where is it now? Sorry. I just want to make my screen bigger, but I don't think it's going to cooperate right now. Okay. Um, so one thing I wanted to share with you and I'll show, share, I'm going to give you this little flip book. Um, some of you might already have it, but I added a resource to it. So if you already have it, when I give you the link, definitely visit it again so that you can download because I've included uh, eight non-routine problems that you can present to your students and detailed answers um, that you can use with your students. And the way I use these with my students is this, it's, it's really flexible. So if I knew I was going to have a little chunk of time, five minutes, 10 minutes, maybe before recess, we cleaned up early. Um, I would put one of these problems up on the board. Students had their own whiteboards and they had about five to 10 minutes, depending on the difficulty of the problem to solve the problem. And they usually did it on their own, but you could definitely have them do it with a partner. And um, after, the t after that time, I would ask um, the students to share if they, the answer, if they got the answer correct. Now, if they got the answer correct, um, then I would have one student come and present. So they would either put their whiteboard or their paper on the document camera, and then they would explain their thinking and how they would do it. Then I would invite another student who got the same answer to, um, but did it a different way. So then they're sharing a totally different way that they solved the problem and then they're having to present it. So students can see multiple ways to solve the same problem. I've also done it where I've asked students who didn't get the right answer, um, but have just seen a student present the correct answer and correct and present their strategy to then explain, well, what did you do wrong or where did you go wrong? What prevented you from getting to the right answer? And those discussions are really interesting to have too. So as you can see, it's not just critical thinking, but the students have to explain their thought processes. And um, it's just, it's really, this, they love it. They get so excited to share. Um, and they actually really like the challenge. What I love is that the problems are always so different that um, it's just, it, it's always keeping them on their toes. So it's not something repetitive. It adds a lot of variety. Now, um, I'm going to be sharing with you eight free problems that you're going to get to use. And one thing I do help students to utilize, they are non-routine problems, but there are four steps that can help them tackle these problems so they don't just throw their hands up in the air and think, I can't solve this, this is impossible, or this is too difficult. So I give them this little um, flip book and we use it together first. Um, and the steps for problem solving, let's see, I'm gonna put this up, let me scoot over. So uh, no, the non-routine problem solving steps are gonna be covered in this little flip book. And I have a tab for each of the four steps. So understanding is the first step. And this flip book at the very top just has um, a little explanation of the step. So it says, this is, the, um, this is a time to just think. Allow yourself some time to get to know the problem. Read and reread. No pencil or paper necessary for this step. Remember, you cannot solve a problem until you know what the problem is. And then I have little questions or prompts that the students can ask themselves for this step. So one of them, does the problem give me enough information or too much information? What question is being asked of me? What do I um, know and what do I need to find out? So there's just some questions that can kind of get them moving through this very first step of understanding. The next step I have, oops, that's not the next step. What happened? Am I out of order here? Oh, I see, sorry. <laughs> okay, two, plan. Um, so for the planning step, I just have some information here. It says, now it's time to decide a plan of action. Choose a reasonable problem-solving strategy. So this is where they get to pick a strategy. 
draw a picture or a diagram, make an organized list, a table, solve a simpler problem that relates to this problem, find a pattern, guess and check. Um, they can act out a problem or work a problem backwards. So solve it from with like the end in mind, um, write an equation, use manipulatives, break it into parts or use logical reasoning. And then again, I have little prompts for them, little questions that they can ask themselves as they're solving this problem. And the next step is execute. So, all right, you understand the problem. You have a plan to solve the problem. Now it's time to dig in and get to work. As you work, you may need to revise your plan. That's okay. Your plan is not set in stone and can ch change any time you see fit. And again, question prompts for them. Am I checking each step of my plan as I work? Um, am I going in the right direction? Is my plan working? Do I need to go back to step two and find a new plan? So that is the step of execute. And then the final step is review. So you can see, there you go. Uh, you've come so far, but you're not finished just yet. A mathematician must always go back and check his or her work. Reviewing your work is just as important as the first three steps. Before asking yourself the questions below, reread the problem and review all your work. And then some of the question prompts I have is, is my answer reasonable? Can I use estimation to check if my answer is reasonable? Is there another way to solve this problem? Can this problem be extended? Can I make a change to this problem to create a new one? Um, I didn't get the correct answer. What went wrong? Where did I make a mistake? And then the very end of the flip book just has a little place for notes in case you or your students want to add any notes. So you're going to get this flip book. Um, it's, a, it's a free resource in my store. You'll just um, add it to your cart and check out with it for free and download it. Um, but remember with it, I'm also including eight um, of those non-routine problem solving prompts so you can get started with your students right away. Okay, well, that's it for me. I'm going to, let me put the link up for you to get the free resources. So if you go to teacherthrive.com forward slash non-routine, it's gonna take you to where you can download the free flip book. And with that flip book comes the problems that you can start get started with right away. There are answer keys so you can review the problems. You can re you don't have to solve them all out yourself because I know you don't have time for that. You can review the um, detailed answers. And then when you do this with your students, don't be surprised if they find another way to solve the problem, um, which is kind of the fun thing about the whole process is exploring and discussing different ways to solve the same problem. So go again to teacherthrive.com forward slash non-routine and you can download that for free. If you have any questions, oh, I will put this link down below um, in the description too, but if you have any questions, you can write them in the comments and I will get back to you with answers. Thanks for joining me. Bye.